Good morning. Good morning. For about four months, I've been diddling on my phone. And now you're all here. It's magic, isn't it? So, um, how moving, how impressive. You're all here. You got here safely, I think, yeah? I mean, if you're not here, you didn't get here safely. So, uh, we'll forget about them. Uh, we're all here. We got such an extraordinary day. I cannot believe that all these people are here at Lark Christ Primary School to share their wit and their wisdom and, uh, and their thoughts with us. Um, how that happens, I don't know. So uh, let's make the most of it. Now, making the most of it, it makes life quite hard for us because we're going to have to work really hard all day to make sure we get the best we can out of it because it's not going to happen again for a while. I couldn't afford to give you a lunch break because there's too many good people wanting to speak and present for you. So you're going to have to be uh, clever about this. You're going to, if you haven't already, the workshop sign-up sheets are on the wall immediately behind me. Sign up, you know, you can sign up for just one workshop and give yourself a lovely long lunch break, go for a wander around the local area. Or you can sign up for two and just take your lunch along to the workshop. I don't think anybody will mind if you do that. You can try and eat between the workshops. We've got so many people that we're just going to have to work on through. Now, hopefully... You're all friendly types. I mean, you look friendly types. Does anybody give me a wave if you're not a friendly type and we'll know to avoid you? <laughs> okay. I'm excited to be in the room with, with Simon and with Martin and with Sue, who I believe is a here, I haven't seen yet, and, and Mary and, and everybody here. I'm excited to be in the room. I want to have a chat with them and I hope they want to have a chat with me. So we're going to have a, a little agreement that we're happy to chat with anybody. I've given you a lovely long morning break and it's your job to go up and grasp someone by the hand and say, I'm so excited to meet you. No, I've been following you on Twitter for two years. I never thought I'd actually meet her. Oh, my God, you're real. You don't look at all like the picture. <laughs> so, I mean, do that. Let's make the most of it. Workshops are there. That's going to be great. We've got lots of talks in here. We've got lots of times to mill around. And we've got our open space session. Is it, did you read Jack's blog on that? Anybody get around to reading Jack's blog? Open space is a, is a mad opportunity. Because normally what happens is you go home from a, a conference and you wish you'd spoken to somebody about something. Damn it, I missed that opportunity. Or you go to the pub after the conference and actually have the amazing conversation that you never had a chance to in the conference. Open Space, which is happening after our two uh, workshops this afternoon, is a chance for you to talk about the things that you want to talk about, that you need to talk about. So what we do is we just note down all the questions and the thoughts people are having and we arrange, say, anybody want to talk about guided reading, okay, well, you go over there. That's your job. So as the morning goes through, as the workshops go through, if you just have a thought of, I really do want to explore that a bit more, now that is grasping me, the person to catch is Jack, who's going to give us a wave. Jack, give us a wave. Where are you? Jack, can you see Jack back there? Jack, he's waving beautifully. He's in charge. So you've got anything you really want to talk about, Jack is your man, and he's going to try and make sure that you get a chance to talk about that in the open space. Housekeeping, sorry about this, we are not expecting a fire alarm today. <laughs> so should you hear a protracted ringing of a bell, you probably ought to get out. Past where Leon is there. That's, there's a door there, you can't really see it, but there, he's opening the curtain, that, that'll be it. And we would go out through that door, we'd go down to the playground where most of you parked, and we'd keep on going as far as we could until we were far away from the building, and then we would just stay there and chill till the fire people tell us we can come back in. But that, I don't think that's going to happen, let's not. Um, anybody find the toilets yet? Anybody not find the toilets and frankly wish they had? <laughs> Most of the toilets up there where you came in, along the corridor. A couple of others scattered around, so if you're in the uh, year six area for a workshop, there's some toilets at that end. <laughs> anything else I'm going to say? Simon, is there anything else I should say? I know. Have I used up my five minutes? I probably have. I didn't use, bring my ukulele on, on stage, I'm sorry. I'll try and do that later if, you, if people are very keen. <laughs> But I think that we should probably crack on. Ladies and gentlemen, star of stage and screen, um, I'll give you Mr. Simon Smith. Give him a big round of applause, come on. Come on. Morning, everybody. Morning. Average. Morning, everybody. Morning. Much better, that makes me feel much better. Uh, slightly scared today because there are people who 
really kind of know their onions. And I, I, I kind of like picture books, but I'm probably, and this is an old reference for old people in the room, I'm a bit of a Cyril Fletcher, uh, which if you know gardening time, I used to go home at lunchtime when I was about eight, and there was this programme called Gardening Time, and there was Cyril Fletcher and Percy Tyler. Cyril Fletcher was a performer who was an amateur gardener, and I feel like I'm an amateur book person compared oh, no, to some not. of the paper. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going pantomime. So, I, so rather than go, going into details about books and things, I thought, I, I can't talk about that because Mary might pick me up on something I might say, or <laughs> Matt might pick me up. So I thought, I know, I'm going to go and do a reading history. So I thought, and there were, I think, Parky teachers had talked about a reading history, and John Biddle had talked about a reading history. So I kind of stopped and thought, I'd have a look at my reading history and think about what implications that has, potentially for a school culture, which seems really random, and it's because it is. So it will either work or it won't work, but I'm not exactly sure, and you'll just have to bear with me. But be grateful it's only 15 minutes. Is that okay? <laughs> right, so my whole reading history in 15 minutes with relations to school culture. So, this was the first book I ever owned. In fact, it was the only book I, I owned until the age of 12. Okay? This was bought to me by my Auntie Pat, and I have... I've recently been given a copy. It's got a different cover, but the inside's the same. And the first thing I have to say about this book is, what the hell was Auntie Pat thinking? <laughs> I don't think there's any other way of saying it, but it's horrific. <laughs> there is blood and gore. There's things being <laughs> cut up. It's an... Sorry, get out the microphone. All right. the Sorry. This, this book is a nightmare. I had so many sleepless nights due to this book. But actually, this was my book. And this book was really important to me. This book, I have read more than anything else in my whole reading career. I must have read the contents of this 500, 600 times. And when I got given a copy recently, to see it all again was like, oh my God, it was just brilliant. And there's pictures of ghosts, like real photographs of ghosts, which I know now aren't real. But at that point, they were completely real. So for me, oh, my screen's gone. Uh, so for me, that book was really important, and it, but, it, but it made me think. First of all, we need to make sure that you make books important. Books, that book was really important to me. My house wasn't a reading house. My home wasn't a reading home. My dad didn't read. He left school unable to read. And there weren't books around the house. Lots of children in my school don't have books. They don't see books. And we've got to give children access to really brilliant books. We set, in school, we set up something called a bedtime library. And we had lots of children in Key Stage 1 who were coming, who parents were coming and saying, they hate reading. And that, there's a bit for me, that's an anathema. That makes me feel quite sick that children are kind of saying they hate reading. And then I, we went and did an audit of our book provision. And actually, I could see why. Because there were lots of really, really bad phonics <laughs> books. And, lots, and actually, what we weren't doing was sharing those absolutely brilliant books. So we set up something called a Bedtime Reading Library, which has your Not Now Bernards, your Where Are the Wild Things, those classic picture books. And parents came, and first day we got about 70% of parents. The next day, the other 35 came, because they were getting to go take books home and read. And it was, and it was about snuggling. It wasn't about the children reading the books. It was about parents sitting and snuggling with their children and reading. And that's so important. And we've got to give children access to books. We've got to give children access to brilliant books. So first thing you have to do in your schools, make sure that books are important and make sure there's access to those brilliant books. So this was my second book. This wasn't my book. This is a reading memory. This is from my class teacher, Mr. Williams, in year five. What would be year five? And he read us Animal Farm. Now, I've had a lot... I put this last year. I posted that Animal Farm was one of my favourite kids' books. People went, Animal Farm's not a kids' book. And, and they're right. Animal Farm is not a kids' book. However, I was read this at the age of 10. And I love this book. And I've got... I've bought my current copy of Animal Farm. I've had about 10 copies of Animal Farm. It's the bit when Boxer... When Boxer gets carted away, I got the injustice. I cried in that classroom, and then Stephen Wood took the mick out of me for the next six months. <laughs> uh, and it was horrendous. And, and, and so, but the importance for me is we've got to read to our class every day. Now, the problem we have with reading every day, and I was in, I was in my Y6 class on Tuesday, and they were reading, they were reading, but then they're pulling it apart all the time. 
all the time we're pulling apart books rather than actually just getting into that flow of actually this is a bloody good story let's just read this story let's just immerse ourselves in story and go with it and instead they were stopping every 30 seconds ago and, and now why do you think they've used that word no just bloody read the book just read it just let it flow make time in that every day so to me that's the one no excuses policy that schools should have i'm not a big fan of no excuses policy but that would be mine that actually we read every day so this was my third book. This is a holiday in Cornwall in 1982. And it's the first book I ever saw my dad read. And because he read it, I wanted to read it. It was a big, thick, fat book, and I didn't <laughs> read a lot at that point. But my dad sat and for that two-week holiday in Hale, Cornwall. He read that book. It was quite a miserable <laughs> holiday. It was very rainy. Uh, and then when he put the book down, I picked it up. But the other thing we need to be is we need to be reading role models. As teachers, we need to show that reading's important and, sh and, and be readers. So it's how do we give that reading a high profile in our schools? How do we show that we're readers? And that's really important. So, 1984. Well, I told you it was a very quick <laughs> trawl through my life. So 1984, I'm in secondary school. Uh, not really into reading. We're supposed to be doing Shakespeare, which to me just sounds like the worst thing in the world. Uh, and I walk into a class, new teacher in school, and he is the coolest teacher I have ever met in my life. And I'm going to tell you his name. His name is Johnny Meth, which <laughs> automatically, <laughs> Johnny Meth, automatically you go, he's really cool. But let me explain to you. Now, in my school, his classroom, uh, my school was in Worcester, uh, was, is next to Worcester Cathedral, and his classroom was in a crypt under part of Worcester Cathedral. So that's quite cool. Uh, walked in, his feet were up on the table. There were really long, pointy winkle pickers. He was wearing black, all black. He was smoking a cigarette. He had sunglasses on. Everybody smoked in classrooms in 1984, by the way. I had teachers with pipes and all sorts. But he was smoking, and it wasn't any cigarette. It was a gauloise. It was French. It was prop. Uh, and he was wearing sunglasses, and he had sticky up hair. And he was the coolest person I have ever, ever seen in my life. And I spent my next three years trying to look like Johnny Meth. Because he looked a little bit like the lead singer of Echo and the Body Man with the hair. And, and, it was, and it was really cool. And he had a cardigan thing going on. It was just... But anyway, he was supposed to be teaching us The Merchant of Venice. And the first lesson we walked in, and he played the dub version of England is a Bitch. And now, for me, I had never heard rap dub poetry. It was, it was nothing. I was bought upon the Carpenters and Simon and Garfunkel. So, <laughs> so rap dub poetry was completely out of, my, out of my framework. But actually, he knew what he was doing. Because I got an understanding of Shylock from that. I understood the idea of the outsider. And actually, I understood that book. And fortunately, it was my O-level book. And it went on and did really well with my O-level because I understood the book and was able to. But it's that bit of we need to make links. We need to help our children to understand and we need to invest time in generating those links beyond the book. We can only do that if we know books. If we know books, we can go beyond that. Now, the next bit is a bit of a leap. And you'll find it's a leap of about 10 years because actually I did my O level and I did my A level and then I stopped reading and I didn't read. Partly because my A-level completely switched me off reading. The only thing I can remember from my A-level is, uh, I think it's Waterland by Graham Swift, but only because they shoved eel down a girl's pants. And that was, that, was, that was the only bit I can kind of remember. So we then go to summer 1995, which is a whole, and I still have the book that I bought that summer, Train Spotting. Now, I was going to read the section of Train Spotting, but one, I couldn't find it without any swear words. And two, I do the worst Scottish accent, and you really don't deserve that. So. But we were, uh, my wife doesn't come from Scotland, but she grew up in Scotland. She grew up in a place called Plockton. And we, we went up to Plockton on holiday, camping in Scotland in the summer. Can I just say, don't go camping in Scotland in the summer. It's a really bad day. Uh, I became a midge magnet and was bitten to absolutely to pieces. So I spent a week and a half in a tent in Scotland. And in that period, I bought this book. And actually, it started me reading again and started to get me passionate about reading again. And I found something that kind of grabbed me, a voice that I hadn't heard. 
And sometimes reading is about that voice that we haven't heard. And it then led me to Ian Banks, and then, and then from then on, I've been a reader. But actually, for 10 years, I hadn't read, really, and never read for pleasure. But actually, to start reading and enjoying books again was really powerful. So one of the things that I think has an impact for school is how do we find the things that fire children? How do we find the things that grab children and make them go, ah, oh, that makes me want to read? Because reading for pleasure is ultimately what we're after. Because if you read for pleasure, then you, you will read all over the place. And we, we really have to look at it. And some of that has to be a, a choice in their voice. I'm not saying there shouldn't be a canon of books. I'm saying, but actually, last year's set of fiction was some of the best fiction I've read <laughs> ever. And there were so many brilliant books out last year that will just be missed if we start just honing it down to we should read these books. And there's books out there. And, we, you know, and we've got to be consumers. And the children are consumers. And actually, they have choice. And they, you know, we've got to find those books which fire them. And then we've got to help them make those links to books which may follow that up and support that. So then it kind of, we go into being in a classroom. And uh, again, I didn't have a huge range of classroom books, but I had some staples and books that I know really, really well. And some of them were Paul Jennings. And I, I still love Paul Jennings short stories. They, they are imaginative and creative. And they're brilliant if you're stuck for something to do in the, in the middle of a day. Because actually, if, you, if a lesson goes tits up, they're the books to dig out. I also found that Michael Rosen's poetry books did the same. And Alan Oldberg's Please Mrs. Butler was often really used. Uh, but then there was this. And this book, this is my fifth copy of this book. And I watched, in June 1999, I watched a teacher deliver a series of lessons with this and was blown away. I'm blown away because this person took this book, knew this book so well that they were able to use it and were able to... And they th and made me think for the first time, one about illustrators, authors, but also about page breaks and how, about how things stop. So I'm going to read you a little section of this and then I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> so, when my mum came in from work and I hadn't got the table laid, she said, if you can't do what you're told, I'll take you to Mrs Cole. Right, close your eyes, everybody. Everybody. Uh, now, can you imagine what does Mrs. Cole look like? Okay, have you got something in your head? What does she look like? Okay, open your eyes. Let's have some ideas. What does Mrs. Cole look like? Martin, what does Mrs. Cole look like? To you? Oh, right, so that's the problem. But if you, if you, go for it. So she's kind of like this old, yeah, this kind of quite vicious looking, kind of tatty dress kind of, wearing Coronation Street. If you do it with children, she will no doubt have warts, boils, spike it. If you stop it at that point, she will become this demon figure. And actually, the ability to know a book well enough to stop it at points that you can actually pull things out of children and to make them explore that book is really important. And that book has been hugely powerful for me because that started me on my journey to loving picture books. So... We need to be reading experts. We need to know the books that we're using in our classrooms. We need to know them really well so we give children that chance to talk and explore. Once we know books really well, we can ask the questions. Now, I've got huge issues with the reading test last year because I think probably lots of people, but my biggest issue was the linearity of the question and the fact I had some really good readers who wrote some really amazing answers and got no marks for them because it wasn't the, mark, the answer in the mark scheme. And actually, reading's more than that. Reading is, is about that exploration and that joy. So, which brings me to December 2003. Uh, in my school, I was working in a school in Middlesbrough at this point, and uh, I would say I probably underestimated children. Yes. I probably underestimated children. And it's that bit where, actually, you can't underestimate children. You need to... And I picked this book and I thought... I'm going to try this book with quite a difficult class in year six in a school in middles in a city Middlesbrough, 93% free school meals, challenging space. And this is what they did. I don't know if it'll work. Oh. In the old days when they started to class, time was thrown by a clockwork. Real clockwork is quite mysterious. Take a spring for instance, like the main spring of an alarm clock. 
It's made of tempered steel with an edge that's sharp enough to draw blood. If you don't treat it with respect, it can spring back and put your eye out. Or take away the kind of iron weight that drives mighty clocks they have in church towers. If your head were under that weight and if the weight fell, it would dash out your brains onto the floor. And once you've wound up a clock, there's something frightful in the way. It keeps on going. Tick tock, tick tock. Once you have wound them up, nothing will stop them. Some stories are like that. Right. And they actually did, we actually filmed the whole book. There is the whole, we, we did the whole book in, uh, but they were amazing. And they, they turned it into script, but actually loved that story. And which brings me then to the last bit as a parent, and this is me as a parent. I've read this book almost every week <laughs> since 2007. And I have, uh, I don't know if I've got time, but have I got time just to read the brief? Just a little bit. Just a little bit. This is for Martin. Your just to. This is your break. Yeah. <laughs> so, now this book is a phenomenal book, but actually I've developed a huge amount of army voices related to this book. So. Uh, in the book, the, pre the, qu uh, the princess tries to take the rabbit away and tries to get convince Emily to... So, an hour or so later, Emily Brown and Stanley were just riding through the Sahara Desert on their motorbike when there was a rat-a-tat-tat at the door. It was the army. The captain saluted and said, Her Most Royal Highness, Queen Gloriana III, greets Miss Emily Brown, and she would like to have the bunny one In return, she offers a brand new golden teddy bear and ten talking dolls that go, Mama! Mama. And I've done that voice for about 10 years now. It's getting quite tired. But my son, that's our chicken soup book. That's the book that when everything's a little bit shitty, sorry, language again, that's the book we go to. That's the book. When I see that book out, I know my son's a bit, he needs that. And it's, it's a really important book. And books are important. So the final bit is enjoy reading. Reading is fantastic. So there are my tips. And thank you very much. Was, was that all right? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I was going to get you to, to give me the edited highlights, but he did it on his last slide. I hope you caught, did somebody get a screenshot of his last slide? Did anybody do that? Did nobody do it? I wonder if I can go back one. Somebody, somebody get a picture of that, tweet it, because that's what we want. Next up, you're just doing that for me, are you? Very good. Um, next up, we got the lovely Mary Meyer, who, uh, who I, I'm astonished that she hasn't got better things to be doing on a Saturday. I'm hugely grateful that she was in here. If you don't know Mary Myatt, uh, you're slightly losing out. So I'm just going to mention, because she probably won't, two fantastic books she's published in the last, in the last year, 18 months, something like that. Um, High Challenge, Low Threat. Um, and hopeful schools. They're both in this little thing down here, where I could find them. They're, and she's got a couple to give away. Go away. Um, particularly mentioned hopeful schools. I read it on a, when I was waiting for an aeroplane. I would missed the uh, first iteration of the aeroplane by drinking coffee and then not getting to the gate. I had my son and my wife with me. I wasn't popular. <laughs> Feeling a little bit down. Christmas time, so I'd had an exhausting term, feeling pretty low. Reading Mary's book was a tonic. Reading Mary's book gave me positivity back because it told me that in schools up and down this land there are people doing things to make a difference. Not because they're chasing Ofsted, although whether that's important or not, that's up to you. Not because they're chasing exam results, those are important, children need them to go forward, but because they believe in, in the power of education, in the power of humanity. As a humanist myself, it was a profoundly moving humanist um, article. I don't think that's Mary's position, but it spoke to me very deeply on that level. So if you haven't read that, it's not what she's going to speak about. She's got a couple of free copies to give away. That's very sweet of her. If you don't get a free one, buy Hopeful School's fantastic book. Now I'm going to fiddle with the computer and maybe she'll diddle around for a bit while I do that. Come on. Bless you, thank you. What's it called? <laughs> Oxford. 
<laughs> See, when you're in Oxford, that's a less useful title, isn't it? It's on the top right, I think, so where Terry put it. Is that look right to you? Yeah, oh, good. well done, yeah, thank you very, very much. Good. Brilliant. And the clicker. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, for the clicker. OK, colleagues, uh, great to be here. No, no pressure then, and, and thank you, Ed. It wasn't meant to promote the book. I just do it because I enjoy writing, really, and it clarifies my thoughts. Anyway, um, I've got 20 minutes to um, share some ideas with you, and I really want to make the case that we should be making things more demanding and more challenging for our kids, and these are some of the reasons why. That the case, making the case for difficult. Um, a lot of the work I've been doing is around um, high stakes, um, high challenge, high threat, uh, which by, for the most part makes us feel incredibly uncomfortable. It's not a great place to be. And one of the things I've been arguing is that under um, our own steam, we're very happy to, to do tests, tests in inverted commas, things like um, Sudoku, word puzzles, um, maths puzzles, uh, but the conditions are different because there's no one who is uh, pointing the finger uh, and making us look like a Muppet. <laughs> okay? Plenty of opportunities for Muppet uh, finger pointing, and I think we've got to be really, really careful that we don't do that. But there are companies that are making millions of pounds of profit out of the fact that we're doing this kind of thing, that we're testing ourselves. You know, they don't give shelf space in, in supermarkets and... Um, uh, news agents to this stuff unless they're making money. So there's something interesting going on that we like putting ourselves under pressure. And I'm arguing from this that we are essentially a challenge-seeking species. We're a challenge-seeking species. Um, and my work with children is supporting this as well. I do a lot of pupil voice and student voice. And there's a big demand, there's a big demand for not watering stuff down. We've got kids at four who are fluent in dinosaurs and Tyrannosaurus rex. And yet we think they can't cope with difficult and demanding words. I'm going to pick that up a little bit later. Um, so some of the things that children say, and I know it's really bad practice, particularly when you're being live streamed, to read something off the board, but I'm actually going to do this because um, I think it's got a real message for all of us about what children are saying about having demanding, interesting, difficult things to do. So I'm actually going to read this aloud. This is from uh, Alison Peacock, the great Alison Peacock's uh, work, um, her latest book on um, assessment without levels. And on ability setting, these are children's views, right? This is what they say. And this was an interview which was taken um, from some children as they started the new year, going into a new year, um, from one of the research schools that have been involved. Okay, so this is what they're saying. That, I'm just going to give the gist of it, that the children who were... Um, at the highest, you know, on the, on the top sets, on the top table, and by the way, children do know what the tables are, whatever we call them. They know the difference between a full stop and an exclamation mark. That, um, that they enjoyed having demanding and difficult work. They actually saw, actually working with a teacher as actually being a bit of a, uh, a, a bit of a downside. They actually liked getting on and working on their own. The children who were identified as the middle ability, wash my mouth out, I think we really need to ditch the word ability. We need to be talking about prior attainment. That's all we can reasonably talk about is low, middle, or high prior attainment. That's all we can say with security. Who are we to say that someone could not go further based on what they've done before? Um, but anyway, the children who are in the middle sets, um, they wanted to have opportunities to do more demanding work but they knew that there were only so many places on the top table. And the children who had the greatest support with teaching assistants were crying out. It's actually a cry from the heart saying they wanted the opportunities to do difficult stuff. Now, I was doing some work um, about six months or so ago in a, in a school in London, um, working, the school had identified that the, um, a group of youngsters in year nine, they happened to be boys, able but idle, Recognize them. Managed to produce a couple myself. <laughs> <laughs> that um, you know, something was going wrong. Uh, something was going wrong. So they wheeled someone like me in to come talk to them. And I said to them, where is the place where you get the most demands on your... Uh, you know, you're really made to think 
and you're getting some personal rewards for that, not extrinsic, it, you know, where you're finding it interesting. And they identified geography, and I said, well, what's happening in geography then? And they said, well, for homework, we're given um, articles to read from geographical magazines, way above, the, they didn't say way above their pay grade, but these were actually way above their pay grade, using demanding technical language, which they couldn't immediately understand, but they were lapping it up. And then at the start of the next lesson, they had to come back and just talk about what they'd taken from it. They were eating this up. It's light years away from low level, intensive filling in of worksheets, which actually is not supporting learning. They were given really, really demanding stuff and then coming back and talking about it. And the point is we don't need to know everything in order to have access to it. The point is, is to be exposed to it. So children are crying out for this. <clears throat> so what are some of the challenges uh, in terms of putting a more demanding curriculum, including reading, for our children? Um, I think that uh, one of the things is the gobbitization of the curriculum. What we've done is we've split up into <coughs> tiny bits what should be a big and coherent piece of work in lots of subjects and including in reading um, to try and make it accessible for children. I'm not, I'm not arguing against, you know, having a precise understanding of what children need to know, but we've got away from the idea that they can have a big picture for this. So you have lessons that are just on fronted adverbials, for goodness sake. You know, I mean, they are important, but, you know, this whole spaggy stuff is the servant of great literature, it is not the master. And somehow we've, we've got away from um, putting things into a bigger and wider context, which is why it was so great to hear Simon talking about, you know, getting the whole book read. Let's stop stopping every two minutes to analyze something. Um, it's, it's, it's actually, I believe, detrimental to learning when we're doing that. I'm not saying we don't do it at all, I'm saying just let's get into the flow of some of this, okay. Um, so the gobbitization of the curriculum is one of the problems. I think a further problem is that um, we think we need to over-scaffold things for our children, which is not always helpful, because quite often we're putting limits on the learning. Now, there's pretty solid research which says, I feel as like I'm stripping off here, I'm going to get shot at that. <laughs> okay, so sodding scarf. <laughs> Anyway, I'm going to trip up on it and I'll break my neck on the way out. Anyway, <laughs> um, there's pretty solid research that says that children who come from disadvantaged backgrounds have heard up to 30 to 32 million words fewer than the children who come from more prosperous backgrounds as a cohort. Got to be very careful that we're not stereotyping children. You can imagine, I'm sure you've got children you can think of in your classrooms and your schools who have pupil premium funding, but they have everything they need. Parents at home are reading to them, singing songs. At the weekend, grandparents are taking them down to the riverbank or the allotment. They just don't have much money. There's no fun having, not having much money, but they do have the substantive stuff for those children to grow. And I'm sure you can also think of children who come from quite prosperous backgrounds, and they've got that pinched look, because no one's ever listened to them. So I've got to be very careful. I've got to be very careful. When I'm talking about this. That um, there are plenty of kids who are actually thriving, okay, but they haven't got much money. As a cohort, though, the language that they've been exposed to by the time they start school is is uh, significantly less than for other children. Now, I, as a teacher, can't do anything about what happens before they come into my classroom or my setting. Nothing I can do about wider society's ills or deficits. But if I know that, I'm going to make sure I have got a language-rich curriculum and offer for my children as a complete and utter non-negotiable. And I think it's very interesting. I can't think of a single primary setting in the country or infant setting in the country that doesn't privilege phonics. It's sacrosanct, isn't it? It's like, even if there's no formal timetable, Phonics is there, yeah? Usually half an hour, usually half an hour. Everything stops for phonics. I'm not disputing it's not a good idea. But I think that only takes us so far. And I think if we're going to be really, really serious 
about extending children's big ideas, access to important vocabulary, we have got to be thinking really seriously about whether we privilege reading time. And reading time which offers them demanding texts beyond their pay grade. Now one of the reasons for this is it's actually a very efficient way of exposing children to demanding difficult ideas and complex vocabulary. Um, complex vocabulary, um, understanding of um, uh, lexical uh, complexity as well can really only come through um, through reading <clears throat> and hearing the spoken, hearing hearing it out loud. Um, it's a very efficient way of exposing them to that. And if we're not doing that, we're actually disadvantaging all our children, but in particular the disadvantaged, from not having access to the wider richness of language, which is absolutely fundamental to future success. Um, and one of the worrying things is, is that there's increasing evidence that reading for pleasure is on the decline, not in schools like Simon's, obviously. Um, and what concerns me is there's all sorts of cheap tricks to sort of gloss over this, a kind of stamps and things. I've read two minutes for pleasure and we have a drop everything and read day once a year. It's like, <laughs> uh, it's kind of not the point. Um, and so I think, well, fine, if that's working in schools, I, I just think it is, um, can sometimes seduce us into think our, thinking our kids are reading for pleasure. So what I'm arguing for is that children are read to on a regular basis, out loud, from a demanding text, and beyond the traditional canon, and I think it's really important, um, uh, Darren later on will be sharing some of the wider texts from wider cultures as well. The children are entitled to this. You're not, you know, we're not doing this, we're actually entitled to them, uh, to have access to this. Um, and I think one of the barriers stopping it that I've picked up in informal conversations with colleagues is it doesn't feel like work on the part of the teacher. Because we've got ourselves into a cycle of busyness. If our curriculum is not covered in worksheets to the power of 10 and our children are racing around after them, it doesn't feel like work. I think we've got to really strip it back and say, what do the children need and how efficiently can I give it to them? And what I would say is a demanding text read out loud is as much an entitlement for children as anything else they might do, as much as an entitlement. So, <clears throat> demanding text that gives them a rich palette, that provides them with intrigue, that provides them with opportunities to say, I wonder, I wonder what would happen if, what's emerging from this. Uh, yeah. and, and the power actually of reading aloud, it's a very, um, if we think back to when we were read aloud to, it's a very, very intimate thing that is going on. And, you know, a lot of the research is saying that the, the enjoyment of reading is partly linked to the extent to which there is enjoyment in terms of the process. And we as teachers can do that. It is much more important than stickers and stamps and stuff. It's tell I'm allergic to them. Mm -hmm. um, it links to, to the oracy. I always forget who the quote is from, so someone's going to tell me again on Twitter. Thank you. That <laughs> writing, writing floats on a sea of talk. Britain, Britain, lovely, thank you. I need to etch that onto my mind. Um, but the talk comes out <laughs> of speculating about interesting, speculating about interesting things to which we have been exposed. If we wanted to put a bit of greater complexity to it, if we wanted to, um, I'm saying we could ask at the odd point, because we don't want to be overanalyzing things, let's just let it sink into our souls, um, is we could ask our children every now and then to pick a word that they'd like to know more about. So I'm doing a lot of work at the moment on, on etymology, because I said at the start that we've got children at four who are fluent in dinosaurs and Tyrannosaurus rex. A lot of our kids know that a dinosaur come, it means a scary lizard, right? 
Um, the point about getting into the etymology playfully puts additional demands on children, which are high challenge, low threat, full of intrigue. But they met, start making some of these big ideas that they're going to be experiencing through their texts much more concrete. Right, I'll give you a couple of examples. We've got um, schools in Suffolk who are um, getting into the etymology as far as teaching about Christianity and RE, year one. Incarnation, big concept. But children have explored. In means in, easy. Carnes comes from the Latin for flesh. We get carnival, carnation, all sorts of playfulness of, around that. But what happens for those children playing with the etymology is that when they're learning about Christmas, it sorts out all the twee stuff. I mean, nothing wrong with the twee stuff, but the underpinning idea, the basket that holds all the the cutesy stuff together is for Christians. It is the key fundamental belief that the divine became human in the form of the baby Jesus. All right? And these year one are doing this, and they're just doing salvation at the moment. They've got into the etymology of, sal of salvation just through the joy of language. So if we wanted to stretch some of our reading, we could actually do a bit of this um, as, as well. So, wrapping up. If it's too easy, I'm arguing, it's likely that the learning is not secure. Because frankly, if all our kids came to school knowing what they needed to know, we'd be out of control, wouldn't we? It's quite important <laughs> they don't know stuff. <laughs> then, we can, then we can talk to them and teach them. Um, and that's what we're here for. That's the, that's the joy of it. Um, but there's a huge amount of research that, not just my anecdotal research, that uh, the cognitive demands are the most deeply uh, satisfying for everybody. And so I'm just talking, let's just stop watering stuff down for kids. And can we remember? <laughs> echoing Simon, uh, to love and to celebrate reading. And uh, if you want to, want to continue the conversation, that's me on the Twitter. But actually just a few things that have informed my writing. This great book, actually, I've got to put it on there, um, Proust and the Squid, uh, really interesting on how uh, we came to read and write. It's not, <laughs> it's not natural, which is why we, we, we need to do some work on it. But it's joyful stuff. Doug Lamov's Reading Reconsidered. Isabel Beck's um, Bringing Words to Life, and then the, the stuff in Moving English Forward from the Ofsted Report 2012, also really interesting stuff to take on board. <coughs> Colleagues, thank you. really enjoyed sharing that with you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Marvel. There we go. Thank you so much for that. Challenging language. Uh, this is Lark Christ Primary School you're in. I don't know if you've noticed, School Lark Christ Primary School. One few interesting things about Lark Christ. One is that we're a storytelling school. Our um, entire curriculum is organised through story, from foundation unit through to the top of year six. Each uh, unit of learning, usually a half term, six week sort of thing. Children take a, a traditional story, usually, not necessarily. They learn the story so they can tell it as a storyteller does. A lot of our children, I don't, if you know Oxford, you probably don't, but this area is hugely mixed socially and ethnically. A lot of our children come to school with very, very limited language. But by learning to speak a story, not by rote, but from the heart, they end up using a wide range of vocabulary, wide range of grammatical structures, and it enriches their language, which we see right through. I could show you a graph uh, showing our improvement in uh, writing since we started this about 10 years ago. We had very, very low base for writing. We now have a very high base for writing, and it's simply because the children are using complex language to retell stories, stories that mean something to them. So um, if you're interested in that, if that sounds interesting, you want to go to, um, si uh, to Chris Smith from the uh, Storytelling Schools. He's doing a workshop, and he's going to talk all about that. We kind of slightly followed his model when we set that up. So demanding language and uh, demanding vocabulary and flexibility of language. Storytelling is an excellent tool for that. I've just covered while he got his thing up. See? See how I did that? Thank you. Uh, hands up if you know who this man is. Not very many. This is, this is, this is the Andrew Buffett. This, this man is uh, passionate about reading in schools, and he's particularly passionate about exploring um, the idea of the outsider and making sure there are no outsiders. That's exactly right. And that's what he's going to talk about. But he, if, he, if he forgets to, he's made a little display of a lot of picture books which are useful. Are you going to mention that? I'll mention it. Yeah, it's on the way. It's just by the coffee. Have a look at that. It's fascinating books. Great stuff. Thank Boom. you very much. Have a clicker. Lovely. See you soon.
Okay, a clap before I start, fantastic. So, hello everybody. Uh, so, this is where I've sort of come from to do this work. So, the, the, these headlines are both about me, two years apart. And the first one says, a uh, gay teacher resigns after parents complained they didn't want to teach their children. That was uh, April 2014. And two years later, in February 16, we have... We respect Islam and gay people. The gay teacher transforming a Muslim school. My school isn't a Muslim school, uh, but 98% of the children are Muslim. So and that's why it says that. So the interesting question is, is how do you get from the first headline to the second headline you know, in, in two years? The first headline was very embarrassing for me um, because I've you know, done this sort of qualities work for, you know, for, for about 10 years and um, I'd written a resource called Transing Homophobia in Primary Schools, CHIPS, uh, yeah, for short, uh, it's been used in lots, lots of schools. Now my own school basically kicked off about it. Um, it was a, a very faith-based kicking off. Um, started with, 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 a, with, with a Christian parent who had a letter saying, as a Christian, I believe, but he didn't want his children to learn about gay people. And then uh, the Muslim community around the school came in and, uh, and it got quite, uh, quite difficult and, I, and I, 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 did, I did resign. But uh, after that, I thought, well... Um, in order to get some credibility back, uh, I need to go to a school where it might happen again. There's no point in going to a nice leafy school where this won't happen. I'm going to go to a school where I might meet the same challenges, but I'll make it, I'll do it right this time. Because I do take responsibility for that, what happened before. Um, it happened because I hadn't engaged the parents, basically. I hadn't pulled them with me. So I went to a school that was 99% Muslim. And I went there to, um, to really work with the Muslim community and find out for me how to engage people who were worried about this kind of work. And of course, not all of the people were worried about it, uh, but, some, but some were. And it took about 18 months, and the situation now is that I'm now out, uh, you know, that we're doing this work, and it's working really, really well. So this talk, basically, I've got 20 minutes to ramble through this, and I'm doing a workshop later on, but it's, it's about how you get from here to here. And it's all through picture books. That's how you do it. Uh, so I'm gonna give you an example. <coughs> Uh, so basically what I did, I, after I left my last school, I rewrote my CHIPS resource. I abandoned CHIPS and, um, and, I, came, and I wrote it, wrote it as no outsiders. Uh, so basically, whereas with CHIPS was a big focus on LGBT equality, uh, and I thought I had to go through that at the time because, because I, I did that because there wasn't really anything else at the time out there for primary schools <laughs> to teach about LGBT equality. But I realised that if, if parents or if some people are worried about LGBT equality in particular, then you need to teach it in context. You can't teach it by, by itself. So what I did was I started using the Equality Act. I started talking about all equality instead of just LGBT equality. So I talk about race, religion, gender, disabilities, age, all the stuff in the Equality Act, basically. And uh, I have um, I've written a resource. Uh, here it is. No outside in our school. Yeah, I have, there you go. Um, and uh, basically, it uses 35 picture books going from reception up to year six, and uh, so what's that? Five uh, less uh, books per, per 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 year group, and um, it really teaches children. The, the the bottom line is basically that isn't it great to be different? Because in our school, in fact, looking around, look around the room now, looking around the room now, I can see people that are different. I can see people of different genders. Uh, different ages, there are disabilities in the room, there are some different faiths I assume in the room. Some people are very, very good looking, some people, um, <laughs> no. some people are quite young. Uh, so there are all lots and lots of differences in this room, and yet, you know, we're all smiling, we're all together, we're learning together in this room, and that's what the UK is like. The UK is full of people who are different, who can get along and work alongside each other, and that's the message, basically. So. This book here, I use a reception. Anyone know this book? It's a very famous book, yeah. So I'll just very, very quickly talk us about Nick and Sue. And uh, Nick likes apples, Sue likes pears, and Nick likes socks, Sue likes yellow ducks, and Nick likes hair, per orange hair, Sue likes purple hair. And it goes to, on every page, they like different things. And uh, at the end, the last page is that Sue likes Nick and Nick likes Sue. So the message in that story, and what we teach this children, is that you can like different things and you can still be friends. And the reception, that's as far as we go. That, 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 that's as simple as that. Because as we grow up, as we go through the school, we're talking about you can be black, I can be white, we can still be friends. You can be gay, can be straight, can still be friends. Muslim, Christian, Hindu, Sikh, Jewish, have disabilities, able-bodied, still be friends. We're teaching children very confidently that, uh, that uh, we are different, but we can still get on. Uh, 
And the equality act is fantastic because there's this line in the equality act which talks about we've got to foster good relations between different people when carrying out their activities. And uh, that's crucial to this work because when we talk to parents who are <laughs> unconfident about some of the aspects of the equality act, we're talking about British law, so we can't opt out of it, or everyone has to do follow British law. And British law says that as schools, it's our job to foster good relations between people when carrying out our duties. So that means people who are different, black, white, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, gay, lesbian, transgender, blah, 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 blah. You know, we need to find good, foster good relations between those people. And how do we do it? So... We talk about, in our school, there are no outsiders, because that's because we're all insiders in our school. In our school, we respect each other's, and these are all taken from the Equality Act. So we respect each other's race, religion, gender identity, age, disability, sexual orientation, and gender. There are no outsiders here. And if you come to our workshop uh, later on, I've got a uh, film, you'll see children and staff and parents talking about what no outsiders means. And the children are very, very confident about this because it's just an easy line to say, isn't it? In our school, there are no outsiders. What's that mean? Well, we're all different and we, we still get along. I have lots of visitors to our school and um, I always say to people, um, when you see a child, please ask them, any child, and it hasn't gone wrong yet, ask your tail light has gone wrong, it went wrong once. Um, um, <laughs> Uh, but basically, I say, any child, ask them and, and just say to them, what, what's no outsiders mean? And I guarantee they'll either say, or get on, on a spectrum, and either be something like, we're all different and that's okay, or you might get, well, in our school, you can be a black or white, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, uh, gay, lesbian, transgender, have disabilities, be old or young, uh, there's no outsiders in our school. Now, it has also, apart from, it, last time I did it, it didn't work, I had a child who went, don't know. So I've stopped doing it now. I'll uh, do it a different way now. But he was, just, he was, he was having a strop, so, you know, you, 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 you get that in primary schools. Um, so that's how, that's how we do it. That, that's how we do it. No outsiders in our school. And all the books that I use focus on, it, the, the best place, the best, best result, that we're different and we get along. It's as simple as that. And um, they're all outside on the, on, on the store. Please don't nick them. You know, but I, I put them all out, so, so go, go and have a look uh, later on. Uh, displays everywhere, obviously we talk about that. that one says we live in the United Kingdom uh, because in the United Kingdom you can be black and British, Muslim British, white and British, disabled and British, you know, it's full of different people, it's a fantastic place to be. Um, oh, and just on that as well, of course the other thing that we're doing here is we are promoting an alternative narrative to what's happening around the world because, because obviously, you know, the, the Brexit for example, um, when that happened, it's quite difficult because that is it's almost anti no outsiders, really. You know, the children talk about, oh, everyone's welcome, blah, blah, and then suddenly we vote to leave the EU. Trump is the same, and so that was very difficult when Trump uh, got in because people were saying, well, well, he wants to build a wall. Does he believe in no outsiders? Mm, you know, well, so, so what we're doing is we're saying, <laughs> What we're doing with, with No Outsiders is we're saying, well, yes, uh, well, we know that not everyone agrees with No Outsiders. Uh, some people want, you know, one kind of religion, one kind of skin colour, one kind of person. What we say in our schools, we want lots of different religions, lots of different skin colours, lots of different people. You know, we want everyone to be different because, because, because we know it works. We're showing people that it works. So our job, you know, when you meet people, someone doesn't, doesn't understand about No Outsiders, when you meet someone, you've got to tell them about it. Basically, you have to tell them, you know, you have to explain to them what No outside this means because because everyone can change ideas can change um, so that's why it's really important that we talk about living in Britain and the Britain that we want to see where we're different that we can get along um, it works for, uh, for bullying as well. It's a great anti-bullying uh, thing because obviously if you're, if you're bullying a school, you're making, you're making them into an outsider. We have no outsiders in our school. And uh, for early years, there's a great book by Todd Park called It's Okay to Be Different. It's, it's a great thing to do, do displays on. You've got kids there wanting things like, it's okay to be black, it's okay to be a girl, it's okay to, you know, I put it's okay to have no hair. Um, uh, so one of us, actually, uh, there's one um, uh, on my new display this year, so a kid has written, it's okay to be adopted, which is a fantastic thing to write, isn't it? It's about children recognising how they're different, but they are happy and they're proud of how they're different. That's what you want children to be, confident you know, in, in, in their world. <laughs> So that's the curriculum, how it works. Uh, so I'll just talk about, about LGBT books. So I, have to, I brought some as, uh, to show you. Um, <clears throat> so although there are 35 books altogether, uh, and in those 35 books, uh, five have LGBT characters in them. Uh, and uh, they're all different kind of characters and stuff. But, uh, but um, I put this in, in nursery, in, in reception, because I really wanted a, a book in reception where just in case there's a child that came in that had two mums or two dads, 
uh, they would see their family was recognised in school and, and their family was normal. Uh, because there's, they, there's very few children's books where there's two mums or two dads. Um, and if a child has grown up with two mums, and that's f for them, that's just the, the way life is, suddenly to come to a school where no one's talking about mum and mum, or no, you know, there's, there's no books where there's two mums, um, suddenly like, might, might for the first time think there's something wrong with their family. So it's really important to have books where everyone's represented. So this book's a really good book for a Jews and reception. M Mummy, Mama and Me, uh, Leslie Newman, talks about, uh, basically on every page, m uh, mums do different things. So mum pours juice in my cup, Mama pours, uh, uh, lifts me up. Mama gently combs my hair. Mama rocks me in her chair. I don't suppose that they do different things. And at the end, they took her in to go to sleep. It's very simple. So you read it and you say, right, do your mums do, mums do that? Do your mums do that? Who's in your family? Who's in your family? Oh, lovely, how fantastic. No, that's basically what, it, uh, what we do. <laughs> And uh, uh, this, uh, I use it in Red Force. It's a great book to talk about, uh, to introduce the concept of being transgender. Because this book is about uh, a crayon who, on the outside, looks like a certain colour, but the inside feels differently. So uh, he, the, the crayon is uh, is red. He's got a red jacket. Everyone tells him he's red. But when he draws, things come out blue. Um, and he tries really, really hard to be red, um, because you know that's what everyone's <laughs> telling him he should be. Um, and so, and people are really helpful. And they sort of they say to me, "Oh, look, I'll colour in with you. We'll do it together." And he tries really hard, but it just keeps coming out wrong. And people tell him that he's wrong. And uh, people are giving advice like, "Oh, you know, you've got to press harder. You're not very bright. You're just being lazy. Um, you know, you've got, to, you've got to apply yourself." And uh, he keeps trying. He, he, he loosens his jacket a bit, and uh, you know, and but it just things keep coming out blue. But eventually, someone says to him, "Can you draw me a blue sea?" And he says, I can't because I'm red. And I'll just give it, give it a go. And he does. He draws a blue scene and a blue bit. Oh, fantastic. I'm blue. And then he can't stop. Everything's blue after that. And, uh, people, are, and people are very supportive. And they say, oh, I, I always knew it was blue, he was saying. And, uh, <laughs> and, um, and um, <coughs> his mum says, my son is brilliant, fantastic. And uh, he's reaching for the sky. So it's a great book to talk again about food, different inside and, and trying something that you're not and all that kind of stuff. It's really, really good. How long, how long have I got? Uh, all day. Two, two, minutes. two minutes. All day. Right, I'll just five minutes. Right, I'll just say it. Do you know um, the most famous one? Tango Makes Three, fantastic, most banned book in America, excellent, so I love using that one. Uh, and just on that as well, there's a, 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 all these lesson plans are, are in the resource, but um, the lesson plan, lesson plan for that for year fives, I use this, and it is, to, it is we, um, there's, uh, uh, you look at articles basically where it's been banned, there's, there's lots of states in the US and Texas and stuff where it's been banned, and, uh, and we write to like, the governor or something and, and argue, you know, so do you want it banned or do we not want it to be banned? Because you know, that's the other thing, I'm not telling children what to write, I'm saying, they need to, you know, write a persuasive letter, either agreeing or, or disagreeing. You know, that's what they do. It's, it's some, some great work uh, with that one. King and King, yeah, lovely. So it's about tell you, most uh, most stories. Uh, the prince marries a princess. Uh, in this one, uh, he marries a prince. The, my favourite bit in this story is basically. Um, um, uh, princesses uh, come to present themselves, uh, and uh, and uh, isn't fancy any of them basically, and he, and, he, uh, and, uh, and he's a bit depressed. And a wait called the page. There's one more princess presenting Princess Madeline and her brother Prince Lee. At last, the prince got a stir in his. Oh, this his heart. That's good. Good. <laughs> it was, it was love at first sight, and then uh, well, and then they, they had a little, little, little happily ever after. So that's really nice. Um, just to finish off, I'm going to. Uh, Click fast all those. Oh yeah, that's the, oh that's the, some great work about the red uh, book. Um, so children wrote a letter to red, and this one is from year four, and it says, "Be the, de, my advice to red: be the colour that you want to be, and don't anyone judge you. Be proud of yourself. There are no outsiders in a pencil case. Oh bless, you know, <laughs> uh, which means that you can be yourself. It doesn't matter if who you are. I am your friend. Just be, just try your best. Use your pupil voice. Fantastic. <laughs> Love it. I know. And of course for that child. Um, my princess boy is great as well, but a boy wears a dress, haven't got time. Just very, very quickly, to show you how far we've moved on uh, from this. So I've been in this for two, two years now, and um, we're at a stage now where we can use the things like this. So Rainbow Laces, Stonewall had this campaign this year about uh, uh, Rainbow Laces to, to encourage uh, footballers uh, to come out, because there are no out gay Premier footballers at the moment. Uh, so, uh, I got sent the Rainbow Laces, I thought, all right, so how can I, you know, what, how can you use it? Because I, I wanted to be very careful about, I didn't want to, you know, give them out, and I'll be accused of, like, you know, 
Oh, you have to be so careful, don't you, about how you use these things. So I thought, well, I want children to want to wear them. So what can I do? So I thought, well, I'll, I'll just tell them about them. And I'll say, I've got them, and I'll leave children to come to me. So I went up to year six, and I took the PE coach with me. And uh, it was great, because he, he wore the laces straight away. And I thought, that's great, because it's one thing me wearing rainbow laces. You know, it's quite another PE coach wearing them. I mean, he looks good in a PE kit. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, he, he can kick a ball. No, more than that, if some case of water him, he can kick it back. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so for him to wear laces, it, it's better. So he wore laces, and I said, right, kids, I, I want to tell you about this. I remember laces about, uh, you know, supporting for everybody, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and I said to them, I'm PK, can, 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 just give me a photo of two, like, cool footballers. I've got no idea. I went to Eurovision. I don't know about football. Um, so, 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 he, so he found, um, he found these, these, these footballers, and, and they're wearing laces. And um, so I put it up on the board, and I said to you, and I said, oh, look, who are these two footballers wearing laces? I said, um, I said are, are they gay, do you think? And the point I was making was, you don't have to be gay to wear laces. So obviously I'm assuming, is, I've missed the point completely, I'm assuming that they're not gay. So I'm saying, are they gay? And the kids will go, oh, no, no. And then one at the back says, um, how do you know? I thought, wow, actually... I'm at the stage now where I'm being taught by the year six children that I am, I am teaching about how to do this work because that's the whole point of laces, isn't it? The whole point of laces is that no one's saying they're gay, but actually they could be. And I'm assuming because they're not, because they're cool footballers that they're not gay, and actually they could be gay. And I've got lads now saying to me, how do you know they're not gay? So it's absolutely the point. So um, I was sort of chastised a bit after that. So, 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 uh, so, 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 so I said, well, I, I've got laces. It, it, anybody wants to wear them, you know, Come and see you in my office. And uh, now I've been teaching for 21 years. I'm a bit long in the tooth, and, I'm, and I, I don't get emotional. But I was really, really quite uh, floored when at half three, the football team en masse came to me in my office and said, we've got a tournament tomorrow. We want to wear the laces. It was just wonderful. And the day after, the hockey, the, um, the hockey team came. Now, half of those can't even do laces up. So... <laughs> They have Velcro, so they wear laces on their, on their armbands, but they, want, but, but they want to wear the laces. So, so, so that's how far we've come. You've now got you know, teams of Muslim children going around Birmingham wearing laces because they want gay people to be welcome in sport, you know, and they're confident about doing that. Uh, so so that, that, that shows how, you know, um, how far we've come. Right, um, these, here are some great books. They're all out on the stores out there. I haven't got time to, to talk to you about now. Space Girl Fuchs is fabulous, by the way. Uh, uh, this is available on stopbullyinginbrum.co.uk. That's the original Chips resource. Um, but I do, and it's, and it's some great lesson plans in there, but I do say don't use that. Use no outsides instead because then it's about getting parents with you. And it's not, not, not about not just doing the gay stuff. However, you know, some people might want to do this gay stuff, so there it is. Stop bullying in Birmingham if you want to use that resource. But uh, that's what I recommend people use. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Is that man a hero? Yes. Yes, he is. Bow! Bow! So there you go. Can't tell you how moved I was when I found, uh, found those original resources online a few months ago. I said, thank God somebody's doing this. I know, I wish it was me, but it's him and it's brilliant. Um, Andrew is doing a workshop. Now, you, you might want to go. He's, I think in the workshop he's going to do a little bit more, unpack how he actually uses his materials. And I think that would be really empowering. So it would be worth going to. I don't know if you have already signed up for another workshop. I don't know. It is all right to vote with your feet. I just want to make sure everybody's got something. Uh, we're going to have a break now. During a break, you could get a coffee. I believe there may be cake. How was the cake? Was it all right? Yeah. Thought it would. If you see Sandra, who cooked them, she, you'll see her at lunchtime. Give her a big hand. I think she's fantastic. Um, while you're out there, do look at our sponsors. They've, they've made it possible for this to happen. And they've got some lovely offers for you. 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 